Welcome back to Meet on Mondays. It has been quite a while. And the reason is, every time we do this, we do something related to deer, and I have not had any in, again, quite a while. But deer season is upon us, and now I have some. And so, as promised, I don't know, like six months ago or something, we're going to talk today about venison ribs. Now, usually, people won't eat the ribs. And the reason, there's two of them, three of them. Number one, a lot of times there's a bullet hole in the ribs. And that is true of some of the ribs that I'll be using today, unless I froze those. But you can still eat ribs even if they were shot in them. And this is not a hunting show, this is a cooking show, so we're not going to dwell much on the actual shooting of deer. So there's number one, a lot of times there's a bullet hole in the ribs. They say, oh, it's bloodshot, I can't eat it. And to a point, that's true. We'll, get, we'll come back to that. Number two is that there's not that much meat on them. And there's some truth to that when they're compared to pork ribs, bear ribs, or uh, obviously beef. There's not much meat on them, but compared to you know, rabbits and squirrels, there's plenty. So there, there is enough meat on them. We had, uh, as I was beginning to prepare for this show, uh, one of my friends said, is there any meat on them? And I told him, like I'll tell you, there's about enough on one rack of a deer's ribs for two large meals. And so, there is meat on them, obviously not as much as on a larger animal, but there's number two. So number one, bullet hole. Number two, there's not enough meat on them. Those are the two myths. And number three, this is, again, has some truth to it. The deer fat tastes terrible. And in the ribs, it's hard to get all the fat off of there. And that's because you have various muscles lobed up on top of each other and stuck to the ribs. And there's no avoiding that. So yes, the fat does taste terrible. Yes, it's hard to get rid of. What you're gonna do, and this is something I've already done before you'll see the video, because I don't show butchering because a lot of people would think that's gross. But what you're gonna do is, if you have venison ribs and you wanna try them, try to get as much of the fat as possible off. You won't be able to get it all off. After you've tried your best, eat them right after you cook them. And what happens is, and I mean as soon as you can, and what happens is, a lot of that fat will run out, but a lot of the residue will taste nasty as it cools. However, if you eat them while they're still warm and you drain as much of it as you can out of there while it's still hot, then you should be good to go. So today, let me give you the rundown before we actually go through how we're gonna do some of this. First thing we're gonna need is deer ribs. I have a lot of them now. We're only gonna need two today because I'm only the only person in my family that eats them and I can't eat that much at one time. So number one, you need deer ribs. You need as tall or deep, I should say, a, a pan as you can get that will hold a rack of deer ribs. You need a brush and we'll see why in just a little bit. You need aluminum foil. You need melted butter, which I just melted right before I started filming. And you need rosemary, garlic. You can use salt if you want to and I probably will, and oregano, and yes, I'm aware of what oregano crushed up in a plastic bag looks like, but I promise you this is actual oregano that came from a community garden here in the town in which I live. You need a Minnesota Vikings mug filled with tea, and then we'll be able to make um, venison ribs. Okay, so now we have our ribs, and you can probably tell just by looking for two of these to fit in a gallon bag, this is not a lot. I had to trim away, and that is kind of getting back to what I talked about earlier with the bullet hole. So I had to trim away a lot to get away from the where the bullet went into the ribs and the bruised area around it. And yeah, I hate that it's a little bit of waste, but it's not really because it goes to my dogs. Um, if you have like if, if you did not shoot it, the deer in the ribs or whoever gave you the meat did not or what maybe you hit it with your car i don't know how, how you get the get the venison but you got it if you have like a complete rack you can cut it into smaller sections or you can use a different venue for for getting the the, the things marinated now here's what i'm getting at so i was able to fit this into a gallon bag and that's great because I then dumped orange juice into, into the bag. I'm going to dump that out in the sink in just a second. But if you can't fit them, and usually you can't. None of the other sections of ribs that I have that I just butchered will fit in a gallon bag. I just got lucky with this and it made it convenient. But 
in normal circumstances, cutting them into smaller but longer strips and putting them into something like this will help out a lot. What I like to do the most, but I didn't this time, is to mix orange juice with a local favorite called Cheerwine, which is a soft drink, and let them sit in that for a day or two. This time I didn't have any Cheerwine on me and I didn't want to go get any. And so, and also I didn't want to use it for cooking because if I had some, I just want to drink it. So I just use the orange juice. What you're looking for is something that's got sugar and acid in it. And so use whatever liquid of your choice and soak that in there for a while. I want to make sure it's good and clean. And again, you want to get as much of the fat off of this as you can. And as you can tell, it's not red. It's kind of a pale, flavor, uh, pale color. And that's because I think I covered this in one of the other sections. Um, before cooking it, I soaked it in ice with salt in it. And the salt draws out the blood and, and such things. And then as the ice melts, it just carries it away. And so that's gonna make it taste a little bit better. And I'm gonna go ahead and drain this and you don't need to watch that. But then we'll get back to how do we make venison ribs. So I've drained one of the racks of ribs. Well, I've actually drained them both. And one of them is sitting here before you. The first thing we're gonna do to make it sticky so other things will go on it and you don't move them off is to take the melted butter and a brush and you're gonna brush that on there. Now, first, I'm gonna put that on the back, the nothing but bone side. And it seems like a crazy idea. Why would you put it on the back? You're not gonna eat the back. And that is because it does help it to cook evenly. Or also it is a little bit like I'm brushing right now of meat, but it's not really that much and most of it'll shrink away. But as it's cooking, it'll cook more uni uniformly if there's stuff on the back, if there's butter on the back. Also, in between those bones, there is meat that's exposed. And so that's one of the reasons why we do the back, even though you're generally not gonna eat much from the back. Having said all that, or done all that, once we get it brushed on the back and you don't spend much time there, you just get it covered, we then flip it over and do the same to the front. Or I guess since it's ribs, it would be the side, to the meaty side. In my house, this is about the only thing we ever use butter for. So I'm not like a butter expert, uh, other than the occasional grilled cheese sandwich. But for whatever reason, I got this recipe from Field and Stream. Butter was called for, I ate it and it tasted good. So that's what I do. That recipe only called for garlic and oregano, which are of course two staple ingredients. But I also like to add rosemary you can add whatever slices you want to yours. And like I said earlier, I like to add salt. What this is going to do, the butter, is it's gonna replace the fat you cut off that also tastes nasty. And it is going to keep it from getting too hot. Just like I put olive oil on a lot of things for that reason, to keep it from not getting too hot, too dry. I'll do the same thing with butter here. Now you wanna add your spices. Garlic uh, powder does not work better than garlic cloves, but it's what I have, and so it's what I'm gonna use. And I'm not gonna use too much of it because Christy, the wife to whom I am married, has asked me to stop eating so much garlic. She actually asked me to stop eating it all together for a while and see if it made me more kissable. All right, rosemary, again, is not in the original recipe that, that, that I got this idea from, but I like it, and therefore it's on there. And oregano. Oregano is something you cannot use too much of on anything. And so we're gonna put as much as we can on there. And that's gonna taste good with the orange juice that's already in there. Last but not least, we have salt. And we wrap it up. So we're gonna wrap it up first in a way that just protects our pan from getting covered in junk, which will happen eventually anyway. And then we'll do a better job with another piece of aluminum foil. There's one, I'm gonna do the other off camera, but first I wanna let you know one thing that's fairly important. See, these are both gonna fit on one pan, that's gonna be great, except the juice is gonna fill this pan up. 
they're going to boil over and it's probably going to make for a messy oven. There's not that much you can do about that. You can set another pan underneath it on the rack below it, but it's just an unavoidable problem. Also, our next step after we cook these is going to be to put them on the grill. Make sure that you drain as much of the juice that comes out of these out of that before it goes on the grill. Otherwise, you're going to have a massive, like, giant fireball, and it's going to mess up your grill pretty bad. I learned from experience. I'm going to do the other one off camera, and I'll be back soon. All right, so these guys are both ready. Here they are, wrapped up in their little aluminum foil jackets, looking perfectly ready for the oven, which is a good thing because that's where we're about to put them. You want to put this on low heat, moderately low heat, for a long time. This is going to be in the oven at 300 degrees Fahrenheit for four hours. Yes, I said four hours. So that the sun that's going down behind me will be long since down by the time I come back. So they're going to go in the oven, again, 300 for four hours. And then after you take them out, you're going to put whatever sauce you like on them and put them on the grill for not that long, just until the sauce turns sticky. Um, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But for right now, again, we're going to put these in the oven. Try not to make a mess, but realize that it's kind of unavoidable. But they're also kind of worth it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stick them in the oven and we'll see you in four hours. All right, so the Vikings won today, so that's that's great. So here's to them. And once these are done cooking, we'll put them on the grill. Welcome back to Meet on Mondays. What has been seconds for you has been four hours here. You'll notice that it's dark. And so there's a glare right here because I don't have any natural light. And so there's lights all around. You know how lights work. Anyway, there's 52 seconds left, so I think, thought I'd give you some instructions on the next thing we're gonna do. The ribs are almost done with the oven half of their being prepared. And I've got barbecue sauce, not much of it. That's why it's upside down. It's gonna be needed to go on there. And you don't have to use, certainly not to use what I'm using. You can use whatever barbecue sauce you like or none or a dry rub, however you want to do it. The next phase in the process is really simple. I'm going to get them out. I'm going to dump the juices because you have butter that's melted and you have the fat that's melted and drained away. And so that's all in that, that aluminum foil. And if you just dump the aluminum foil onto the grill, you're going to have a huge fireball. And I learned that from tragic experience. And we're done. That's pretty loud, I'm sure, for you. So let's get them out and see what they look like. Warning, these bad boys are gonna be super hot when we get them out of the oven. So, well, they'll be 300 degrees. Let's see what we have. It looks exactly the same as it did when it went in, just a little bit browner. So again, warning you, it's going to be hot. My process for doing this is I'm gonna just drop the whole pan in the sink and let the juices drip where they may. I'm gonna carry all this downstairs, but it might not be downstairs in your houses, but I'm gonna carry this to the grill and I'm gonna put them on the grill and I'll explain when we get down there what we do next. Okay, so now we have bumped our camera. Okay, so now the ribs are out of the oven and I've drained the juices or at least I've opened the tin foil, aluminum foil. The step that I did not mention earlier is we need to put the barbecue sauce on them and spread it out. Now, usually a sane person would use a brush to do this, but I only have the one because I don't use them that often. And I've already used it and I haven't washed it again and that's gross. So since this is already made meat, I don't want to taint it with raw meat and therefore I'm going to have to use my finger, but I have a clean finger. In fact, I'm going to wash it before I do it just to make sure. Um, but you would probably use a brush for this. So I'm going to spread the barbecue sauce all over here. Just use as much as you want or as little as you want. And then I'll take them to the grill and get them you just five minutes at the most where you're going to grill them at whatever temperature you want. You don't want to dry it out, but you do want the sauce to get off sticky and kind of caramelized and delicious. So I'm going to get to finger spreading after I wash my finger. Well, 
I'm gonna say hands because wash my finger sounds gross. But anyway, I'm gonna spread the barbecue sauce on after I wash my hands and then we'll move this party down to the grill. Okay, YouTube, I am back and I'm in front of my grill. So uh, I have already put the ribs on there. It is currently at just under 400 degrees. Again, temperature is not that big a deal here uh, because all you're doing is you're kind of solidifying, I guess. You want the sauce to be sticky. You want the ribs to kind of hold together a little bit better because when you get them out of the oven they will fall off the bones and so they threatened to do that before i even got them on the grill anyway it generally doesn't take long just you know, five minutes or so again all this stuff you see down here if you were to just which i did this the first time just take the aluminum foil and dump the ribs out on there that would be a big mistake because that stuff when it gets into the grill will detonate and it really messes your grill up pretty bad I mean, it's cleanable, but also if you look, my you can see it now. So the the porch is above my grill, and I don't really want it catching on fire. All that said, we're almost done. We're rounding the home stretch, and and that's a good thing because I'm hungry. It's almost ten o'clock. I'm starting to hear some sizzle, and I'm going to check it and see how the um, the the sauce is doing. Um, it's really about the meat, not the sauce. You do want the sauce to be at a certain stickiness, tackiness, but it's more about the meat. You're trying to kind of solidify it almost as if you were searing it, but you're not really searing it because it's already been cooked. That's about where I want it. Uh, this is the thick parts in there. I uh, still have a little bit to go, but that's about where I want it to be. So I am going to take these off and the last thing you'll see will be a still photo that you'll probably see at the front of the video as well. I don't know if you like these videos or not, but if you do subscribe, like all that stuff, but, um, or, you know, comment and tell me, Hey, you're wasting our time and that'd be fine too. Um, but I enjoy doing them to some degree. Mostly I'm trying to share the joy of venison which is often mischaracterized as gamey by people who it's not that they don't do it right it's that they haven't learned uh how to do certain things and so we're gonna rescue the american whitetail as a culinary delight all right thank you guys for joining if you did and if you didn't then you know i don't see this anyway and i hope you have a great uh time um we'll see when i started these as a kind of a cure for coronavirus boredom i didn't think it was going to be december and i would still need a cure for coronavirus boredom but that's the world we live in so stay safe stay sane and treat those around you with love because they're all you got all right uh, didn't really need to give you that sermon, but you just got it. These are venison ribs, and I hope that if you decide to make them, that you enjoy them as much as I will. Thank you, guys.